The drugs were there. I did not put the narcotics there. Procuring lewd exhibition. Defendant is guilty of the crime of procuring lewd exhibition. Guilty of the crime of forcible oral sodomy. Guilty of the crime of procuring lewd exhibition. Guilty of the crime of forcible oral sodomy. <laughs> I wish he was the one with the gun he had killed me. No police officer ever would want to hurt an innocent person. <laughs> This is Daniel Holtzclaw, a former officer of the Oklahoma City Police Department who was convicted of multiple counts of sexual assault, sexual battery, and other sex offenses. She got inside the car. She got inside. Did you go get in the car and talk, or did you stand there with the door open and talk to her? I think I did get inside the car for like a quick minute and just see what's the deal is just talking to her. Did your pants come unzipped, unbuttoned anything while you were standing right there? I don't know what to say, I mean, because it just looks like I just caught you in a lie, and now I don't know I, what to believe. Nothing was done, as far as that. No. As per reports, Daniel targeted African-American women with priors and drug issues, believing they wouldn't report him out of fear. Daniel was brought in for questioning at the same place where he worked as a cop. You made her lift up her shirt, and, she, and when she lifted up her shirt, she exposed her breath. What about pants? Nothing in her pants as far as that concerned. She was wearing tight jeans. So. She said she pulled them down. Do you recall putting your in her mouth? I don't. Daniel maintained his innocence, even when confronted with the possibility of video evidence. Sir, I'm, I'm sticking with my story. I'm, I'm... Okay, okay. On the video, are we going to see her Shouldn't see her I didn't see her Okay. Are we going to see her pull her pants down? I didn't see her pull her pants down. Are we going to see your out? No. Are we going to see your in her mouth? No. His DNA sample was taken to match the evidence found in his car. CSI is processing your car right now. Right. And when we stepped out, they found some pubic hairs. Daniel's conviction was based largely on loose DNA evidence and testimony of the victims, some of which turned out to be false. But you lied on everything you said today. Yes or no? Yeah. So he never touched you? Is it yes or no? No. So you just made up the entire story? Yeah. Shanice Barksdale, who filed a sexual assault report against Daniel, gave this incredible reason for her actions. I just felt bad for her, and I just wanted to know, like, she wasn't the only victim or anything. And you thought it would do what? Make feel like she's not the only one. Terry Morris, another alleged victim, even refused to testify in the first place. You know, you know, I got to encourage you to go through and talk to me. Uh, but if somebody else can do it. I don't want to. I just want to leave it alone. She clearly didn't want to be there. Okay. Is there anything that I can do to persuade you? To, to help no, make you no, stronger? No, no, no. While one victim, on the other hand, gave a totally wrong description of Daniel. Tell me your description of him. He's black. He's okay. He's black male. One accuser was even caught on camera, admitting that she wasn't sexually assaulted at all. So this is good evidence? Well, you tell me. I think so, because, I mean, y'all... Even if, like, even if he didn't, like, even rape nobody or nothing, he still didn't, he still didn't talk to the people that he was arrested. It was also reported that the accusers were lying with the intention of profiting from lawsuits. They lied on the stand. They lied to the jury. They're involved in civil lawsuits where they may collect millions. This is an injustice, and the public doesn't want to be bothered with it. There was even a secret trial held allegedly without Daniel or his defense team's knowledge. Surveillance cameras capture a team of prosecutors, including the lead in Holtzclaw's trial, arriving ahead of the proceedings. There were two full days where the secret hearing was going on and my lawyer wasn't allowed to be there. Let them know, know about it. Also, the lead prosecutor in my trial, who lied, gets to weigh in on a response or has to do it. How is this in any way safe or fair to me? Daniel alleged that his DNA was planted rather than coming from direct sexual contact. I'm not a you know, they were setting me up, but uh, something was tampering. And then I was like, are you serious? 
Daniel was eventually found guilty for a majority of his charges. This is when he hit rock bottom. Procuring lewd exhibition. Defendant is guilty of the crime of procuring lewd exhibition. Guilty of the crime of forcible oral sodomy. Guilty of the crime of procuring lewd exhibition. Guilty of the crime of forcible oral sodomy. A visibly distraught Daniel sobbed inconsolably while the judge read out the rest of his verdict. Daniel was sentenced to 263 years in prison. Mr. Holsclaw, this jury finds you guilty of the various uh, counts. He maintains his innocence to this day. While Daniel Holtzclaw will spend the rest of his life in jail, how does it compare to using police power to assault minors? Like in the case of Jalen Fleer, a San Diego County Sheriff's deputy whose life will completely change after this interview. Have you ever shared any images of your penis with anyone? Yeah. Today, Fleer was being investigated based on an anonymous tip by Crime Stoppers. So you understand that you're not under arrest and you are not being detained. Um, you understand that you're free to leave at any time. There will not be any locked doors keeping you from leaving us. You notice that one doesn't have a, a lock behind you. Yeah. Yeah, so we're looking into some allegations that were made. We're kind of, it, it started with a Crime Stopper report. So we're just kind of going from there. You know, we're investigating allegations that were made that you were communicating with a younger female on Snapchat and potentially some material might have been shared. Okay. Um, some photos, some images, stuff like that. As per reports, Fleer used to message minor girls on Snapchat, attempting to meet them for sexual purposes. He then offered them money as an incentive to meet. One of the girls was just 12 years old. Fleer also offered more money to the girls if they managed to invite their underage friends. In court, the prosecutor read the explicit messages that Fleer sent the minors. The detail he goes into with regard to his sex exploits that he is trying to engage in with young children are just despicable. He tells multiple 12-year-old girls, do you have any younger friends who are interested in older men? I'll give you money to hook me up with them. The younger they are, the better. He had asked her about soliciting younger friends, and she mentioned a nine-year-old friend. Um, you know, the defendant got excited about that prospect and tried to convince her to talk her nine-year-old friend into having a threesome with him. The prosecutor also said the girls were afraid to report Fleer to the police because he was the police. Fleer's defense asked for a lenient sentencing. Mr. Fleer and his wife were expecting the birth of their first child. The child was going to come any day. And Mr. Fleer, without hesitation, said, I'm ready to surrender. But the judge was having none of it. I, I have never seen a more despicable set of facts as I've seen in this case. Fleer was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Jalen Fleer will spend a better part of his life in prison for targeting minor girls. But what happens when an officer abuses his power? Like what happened when Officer Michael Amiot pulled over a car for a traffic violation in Euclid, Ohio. Sitting in the car was Richard Hubbard III and his girlfriend. But the traffic stop was anything but routine. Initially, Richard complied with Officer Amiot. But when Amiot tried to handcuff him, Richard resisted. Heard that pop? That was Richard getting tased. The struggle ensued, and the officers got more and more aggressive. On her knees, Richard's girlfriend begged them to stop. But the scuffle ensued, and Amiot kept throwing punches. A passerby took this video on her cell phone, showing Richard with his head under one officer's knee, while Amiot delivered one final blow. In court, Amiot said that he acted according to the law. Initially, when we go down to the ground, well, he was wrestling with us, and he does throw a punch at me. That was just shown. But if he's wrestling with us, we use strikes. But he also admitted that he kept punching an already subdued Richard. Flurries of punches that you threw did he swing back at you one time? While I was throwing the punches, no. The prosecution said that Amiot violated Richard's civil rights with excessive police force. 
Assault has been proven beyond any doubt, basically. Michael Amia says that he was justified in using force because he's a, a police officer. That is the start of a violation of the civil rights. The defense argued that Amiot acted according to his training and protocol. With police policy that governs Officer Amiot and all officers of the Euclid Police Department. But the judge was having none of it. And I did listen to your trainers, your prior instructors. I did listen to them, but I, I do believe in this case, I believe the jury got it right. The jury found Amiot guilty. We, the jury being duly impaneled and sworn, do hereby find the defendant Michael Amiot guilty of assault. The judge agreed with the jury's verdict. Police need to be able to control folk, no doubt about that. There must be control, but uh, there's a limit to how that's done. Amiot was sentenced to 30 days in jail, 60 days of house arrest, and three years of probation. He was also fired from the Euclid Police Department. The court at this time will impose a sentence of uh, 90 days. I appreciate the, uh, the jury and the court for making the right decision. You know, what Amiot did something wrong, still going through like the suffering with anxiety. While Michael Amiot lost his job and reputation for showing excessive police power, what happens when you're caught luring a minor with intentions to exploit them? This is a sting operation by YouTuber Musa Harris, also known as the Luzerne County Predator Catcher. Musa, at the time, had no idea that he was about to catch ex-police officer Leonard Galley. Hey, what's going on? What are you here for? How you doing? What's your name? Paul. Paul? Yeah. What are you right here for? What's that? What are you right here for, Paul? Me? Yeah. I'm here to meet some of my friends. Musa posed as a 15-year-old boy on a dating app to lure out Galley, who went by the alias Paul. You got the wrong guy. Buddy, Paul? No. My name's not Paul. You just say Paul. No. You just say your name Paul. My name's not Paul. You got the wrong guy, buddy. Galley quickly changed his story. He also racially abused Musa. Got one again right here. Galley panicked and left in a hurry. Galley was well known in his community for being involved in weird and perverted things. You, know, you do hear the rumors and he's always running around doing some perverted stuff. I would like to see him get punished to the full extent. It's disgusting. Galley pleaded guilty to felony charges of solicitation and unlawful contact with a minor. His lawyer argued that he was suffering from depression and never intended to harm anyone. Galley was sentenced to one to two years in prison, followed by five years of probation. He was also registered as a tier three sex offender and was prohibited from teaching, coaching, or attending places where minors frequent. While Leonard Galley will spend a year in prison for his perverted actions, how does it compare to murdering your neighbor? Like in the case of Dallas police officer Amber Geiger, who one night made a shocking 911 call. Get up, man. Yeah, that's This is Carla. Where's your emergency? Hi, this is an um, off-duty officer. Um, can I get, I need emails. Um, uh, I'm in, number. I What's miss, going on? I miss, I'm an off-duty officer. I thought it was at my apartment, and I saw a guy thinking that he was, thinking it was my apartment. He saw someone? Uh, yes, I thought it was my apartment. I'm oh, my God. I'm sorry. Okay, and the, where, where are you at right now? I'm inside the apartment with him. As per reports, Geiger entered the apartment of her neighbor, Botham Jean, and shot him twice. She claimed she mistook Jean's apartment for her own and thought he was an intruder. Authorities soon arrived at the scene. Time was running out for Jean as officers desperately tried to revive him with CPR. Jean died at the hospital soon after. Geiger was interrogated where she maintained the same emotions as the 911 call. Still felt like that guy was gonna kill me. Oh, oh, she was alive. Later in court, the prosecution argued that Geiger acted unreasonably and recklessly. She's leveling off her gun, having acquired her target, and she shoots at him twice. No opportunity for de-escalation, no opportunity for him to surrender. Bang, bang, rap, double tap. They said Gene was in a defensive position when he got shot. It's bow in the chest just above his left nip. The path of that bullet goes down into his heart, does absolutely devastating damage. Goes through his lung, goes through his stomach, goes through his intestine, until it finally comes to a rest in what's called the psoas muscle, which is halfway between his stomach and his back. This path 
is very revealing because it is consistent with the fact that Bo was getting up from a seated position and facing the door as Amber Geiger was coming into his home. The defense argued that Geiger made an honest mistake and acted in self-defense. Amber Geiger firmly and reasonably believed that she was in her own apartment, that she had confronted an intruder, that she had no choice, that she had no options but to use her gun to keep from, from dying. Residents of the same building recalled what exactly happened that night. Uh, let's go in and I think I was, I was about to cook me something to eat. Okay, what happened then? And then I heard gunshots. Okay, how many gunshots do you remember? Two. Uh, anything that you saw that made you think, hmm, that's different? I uh, just, like I said, I just noticed it was an officer walking in. Uh, I mean, I saw a she had a bag, and I mean, I just kind of saw it and w went to my apartment. Geiger took to the stands next. And I'm saying, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. What were you focused on? Him. Just him? Yes. And then he began coming for you? Yes. And as he began coming for you, that's when you heard him speak? Yes. I'm going to do that now, right? Yes, sir. Hey! 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 And that's at that point whenever I shot Somewhere in this area? Yes, sir. When you shot, what happened? He fell down. She broke down and apologized for her actions. And I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. However, what Geiger said next shocked the whole courtroom. Shooting him in center mass exactly where you are trained. You intended to kill Mr. John. I did. She literally confessed to killing Botham Jean. Geiger was sentenced to 10 years in prison with the possibility of parole after five years. We, the jury, find unanimously that the defendant did not cause the death of Botham John while under the immediate influence of sudden passion and assess the defendant's punishment at 10 years imprisonment in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. This case had an unexpected moment of grace and forgiveness when Jean's younger brother, Brant, took the stand. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family, but I love you just like anyone else. I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die. He forgave Geiger and wished her well. I personally want the best for you, and I, I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. But what he did next was seen as a powerful gesture of compassion and healing. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Another moment of kindness came from the presiding judge, Tammy Kemp, who hugged Geiger and gave her the Bible, telling her to read it and find God. Amber Geiger was sent to 10 years in prison for accidentally killing her neighbor. But what happens when a crooked cop gets caught? Like in the case of Zachary Wester, who was charged with racketeering and false imprisonment in Florida. The drugs were there. I did not put the narcotics there. As per reports, the 28-year-old former sheriff's deputy was accused of planting drugs on unsuspecting motorists during traffic stops. At this point, you are detained, okay? I don't do anything. Okay. I don't mess with that stuff. The drivers denied knowledge of the drugs, but were arrested anyway. The syringe is actually in like a plastic larger baggie with a plastic container with a substance in it that appears to be an illegal narcotic. Do you know anything about that? I do not. Some of Wester's victims had other prior offenses, which made the alleged possession charges even more serious. Look, oh, man, you seem like you're pretty squared away, okay? Yeah, yeah. All right. But I do have an issue with something within the vehicle. What's that? Pulled you over. Your driver's license is not valid. Okay. Pulled you out to talk to you, buddy. And for the poor souls who resisted and protested innocence, Wester used his taser on them. Damn face, I'm going to y'all in hell's way here in just a minute. He didn't have anything. That was a slick move, man. Very slick. Hey, man, man. Go ahead and put your hands no, on Don't, 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 don't do not do this. That's right. That ain't mine, man. What'd you do? That's not. Don't you? What are you doing, man? After a while, the arrests caused suspicion internally. Began what's called an internal affairs investigation into the defendant's use of his body cameras. Wester was suspended from the sheriff's department. First, he made the recommendation that the defendant be suspended pending the outcome of the investigation. 
the case went to trial where Wester pleaded not guilty to all charges. This is a case about an abuse of an incredible power. The defendant used his position as a deputy sheriff to make traffic stops on 12 members of this community and plant methamphetamine in their cars, methamphetamine and paraphernalia. He turned what should be a law enforcement agency, and is, into something for his own use that was criminal. Some of Wester's body cam footage was found mysteriously deleted or unusable. Why in the world would that have been deleted? I wish I knew that answer. However, the prosecutor found something suspicious in one of Wester's body cam footage. Why in the world does the defendant have palmed in his hand, which is clasped like this, not like this, not like this, like this, a plastic baggie? Why in the world does he have that there? I would submit that this is objective evidence where you see him planting drugs in the moment. You see something in his hand that has no reason, no logical reason, given this stop and what we know about it, for it to be there. This is him planting evidence, and you see it. Wester's victims testified in court. I knew, I knew my truck was clean. I knew it was. The white, small plastic baggie that was in that spoon that the deputy just showed you on this video. Had you ever seen that before? No, sir. Was that in your car? No, sir. The other thing I really saw was the fact that he did kept going into the car like several times, over and over and over again. Because he'd come back, he'd talk to me, he'd go back to the car, he'd come back to me, he'd go back to the car. Curiously, Wester's body cam was always well placed to miss the exact moment when he found the drugs. In a split decision, the jury found Wester guilty of 19 of the 67 charges. Count one. Guilty of racketeering as charged. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Guilty of official misconduct related to Teresa Odom as charged. Wester was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Therefore, it is the intention of the court that you were sentenced to serve a total of 12 years, six months, and eight days. While Zachary Wester will spend significant time in prison for being a crooked cop, what happens when a cop commits a brazen crime? Like in the case of Wayne Cousins, a metropolitan police officer who was arrested on suspicion of kidnapping and murder. Sat in handcuffs and what I know her. So you must have something to say that I, I know her. On the night of March 3rd, 2021, Sarah Everard was walking home from a friend's house in South London, England. Unaware to her, she was being followed by a white car. It was the same white car that Cousins had hired that morning from a dealership in Dover, Kent. That night, dash cam footage showed the white car pulled up to the side of the road with hazard lights on. It also revealed Sarah and Cousins standing next to the car. Cousins reportedly used his police warrant card and handcuffed her into his car, pretending to arrest her for breaching COVID-19 rules. The car was next seen driving towards Kent. The next morning, Cousins was seen buying petrol and rubble bags, possibly to dispose of something. Sarah was reportedly sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Cousins allegedly burnt her body and dumped her remains in a pond near his woodland property in Ashford, Kent. This evening, detectives and search teams investigating Sarah's disappearance have found, very sadly, what appears to be human remains. Police interrogated Cousins as he was the last person who met Sarah. Well, I said, you've been arrested on suspicion of kidnap, and we believe that you've been involved in her disappearance and taking her away from her family. Cousins initially denied any knowledge about Sarah. So we're here to talk to you about Sarah. Show the picture. Do you know Sarah? I don't know. So do you know where Sarah is? No. Have you ever personally met her? No, not personally met her. You had any interactions with her at all? Uh, why is it, why, why, why would I have personal interactions with her? But the officers were convinced they had their man. Now, we believe that you know something about where she is, and that's why we're here to look for her and to try and find her. And that's why we're talking to you now, is to try and get you to like, have a good think about it and test anything we can about where the light is from. What cousin said next will blow your mind. Okay, um... Well, I am in financial and I've been lent on by, I don't know who they are. They're a group, a gang, whatever. And they told me why I need to go and pick up girls and get them to them. So I said, what's happening? And it then came through that 
they're going to harm my family, take them away, and they'll use them instead. But at that point, I had no option to try and find somebody. So I don't, um, there's, there's a couple of names I was told a place to um, take her. That's it. That's all, that is all I know to this group of people. Cousins initially claimed that he was being pressured by a gang of Eastern Europeans to kidnap Sarah. They, they threatened they threatened to take my family away from me. Tell me everything you know. That okay, I think that you'll have a there was a white sprinter van. Um, they um, are between sort of Lennon, Maidstone area that I've got to off. Um, parked my car up and then the van come up behind me, flashed me and they all jumped out. Um, and then they, they, they took this girl. Ugh. Cousins gave some vague answers when asked about how the gang contacted him. Yeah, all right, but how do they contact you? How did you contact them? I tried to overwhelm one of their cool girls and rip her off. So she's told them and they, they got me. How did they contact you? How, how is it they've been in contact with you to make them threats? They just, they just tell me, be here, be here. So Hotel Burston, Danny Folkestone, could be here. Okay, so I turned up, but I've got no mobile number and they have got my mobile number. They haven't. They're obviously outside watching, following, uh, just honestly. How are they telling you to be there? How is it they're, they're giving those directions? Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. They'll, they'll come outside. So they'll be outside here. Yep. And then they'll say, right, you're going to be in Folkestone at this time, or you're going to be in Ashford at this time. That's it. There's no links, no telephone numbers. I'm completely on my own. Cousins pled guilty to all charges. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a whole life order, meaning he will never be released. Later, Cousins received a 19-month sentence for a previous offense. The judge in that case said Sarah Everard's murder could have been prevented if the authorities had treated the earlier case seriously. The fact that no police came to find him or his black car to question him about these incidents can only have served to confirm and strengthen in the defendant's mind a dangerous belief in his invincibility. Wayne Cousins will spend the rest of his life in prison for his perverted actions. But what happens when cops steal from you? The woman behind this video stealing stuff is Smith County Chief Deputy LaQuenda Banks. Banks, along with Constable Curtis Trailer Harris and Sergeant Derek Holman, arrived at a home in January 2021 to serve an eviction notice. The trio cleared the renters out and started rummaging through their belongings. Banks had her body cam switched on by mistake, which caught every moment of their actions, from cash to Apple products to expensive glasses. Ray-Bans. Banks put everything she found valuable inside her pockets. She later dumped them inside Sergeant Holman's car. The presence of drugs made the house an easy target. Did that discovery of drugs all of a sudden Make them an easy target. Yes. Constable Trailer Harris went to trial first, where he initially denied any knowledge of the theft. What we see Miss Banks doing on the video, as everyone has seen it, were you aware of what she was doing? No. Never seen me pick up anything or conceal anything or hide anything. The detective investigating the case believed Trailer Harris was in on the crime. He was doing this unbeknownst to Constable Trailer Harris. Why would she say it out loud? I have no idea. Maybe because he was in on it? I believe so. Does there appear to be a scheme here? Yes. Banks testified in court against Trailer Harris. Did you, what did you believe in to mean by that at that moment? Whatever you see, and you, if you want it, take it. Banks said she was coerced by the defendant to steal. He was my boss, so. I mean, I'm going to do what he says do. I was forced to do it. If I would have said no, I would have most likely gotten fired. Trailer Harris was found guilty and sentenced to five years of probation. He said he regretted his actions and apologized to the victims. First, I'd like to publicly offer a apology to the Foster family, the actions of my deputies that day and the inaction of me, of me to stop it from happening. Um, I sincerely apologize to them for that. I put myself to the academy twice, and it's just something I want to do my entire life. So. Just the thought of it not being able to do it anymore, um, it's devastating, but I just want to be able to move on from it. Banks saved herself from jail time by testifying against both Trailer Harris and Holman. Derek Holman was later found not guilty and was acquitted of all charges. 
While the three dirty cops got away with relatively lighter sentences, how does it compare to killing an innocent woman who was just trying to defend her family? The incident occurred on October 12, 2019, when a neighbor called a non-emergency police line. I'm calling about my neighbor. What's going on there? Well, the front doors have been open since 10 o'clock. I haven't seen anybody moving around. It's not normal for them to have both of the doors open this time of night. 28-year-old Tatiana Jefferson was having dinner with her nephew. She left her front door open to let smoke out after burning some hamburgers. Officer Aaron Dean and his partner arrived at the scene. They walked around the house and looked for signs of a break-in. The officers didn't announce themselves, thinking it was a burglary scene. The glass door was shut. The inner door was open. It looked ransacked. It was, it was a mess. It looked like someone had methodically gone through that house looking for something. What happened next would change their lives forever. I was looking right down the barrel of a gun. And when I saw the barrel of that gun pointed at me, I fired a single shot from my duty weapon. As Dean approached the rear of the house, he spotted a figure through the window aiming a gun at him and immediately fired. Put your hands up! Show me your hands! As the dust settled down, Dean realized what he had done. Uh, when my vision cleared, then I observed the person that we now know as Miss Jefferson. I heard her scream and, and saw her fall like this, and I, I knew that, that I'd shot that person. Dean admitted that he didn't do competent police work that night. You tried to open the window to get inside a house where you didn't know where unknown assailants could be hiding that could be armed. Is that what you're telling this jury? Yes. That's your sworn... Is that good police work? No. A psychologist assessed Dean as narcissistic and not suitable for police work. My conclusion was that he was not psychologically suitable to serve as a police officer. And why is that? Because the results had suggested that he had a narcissistic personality style that would inhibit his judgment, decision-making. The prosecution argued that Dean did not give Jefferson enough time to comply with his commands. Look at the audio. Half a second from the first command to where, and it's put up your hand, show me, bam. Half a second. No one can comply with that. No one. She never had a chance. There was nothing she do. Nothing that she could have done could have changed what was going to happen because that man decided when he got to, to that home that he was going to be a hard charger. He was going to be gung ho and he was going to take command of this situation. Jefferson's 11 year old nephew testified in court. How did you think she was hurt? Because she was crying and just shaking. What were you thinking? I was thinking, is it a dream? Dean was found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to 11 plus years in prison. Verdict reads, we the jury having found the defendant Aaron York Dean guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of the offense of manslaughter, assess his punishment at confinement in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for 11 years, 10 months, 12 days. The non-murder conviction did not sit well with the supporters of the victim. He says that the girl is dead. That's all the evidence that we need. She is dead. 77 seconds. And he get manslaughter. Aaron Dean will spend almost 12 years in prison for killing an innocent woman. But what happens when cops try to send an innocent man to jail? Like in the case of Marcus Jeter, who in 2012 was charged with resisting arrest and assault based on this dash cam video. Get down! Stop resisting! Stop resisting! Why are you trying to get the gun? Get off my gun! That night, Jeter was pulled over by Bloomfield cops Sean Corder and Orlando Trinidad. Jeter, however, refused to come out of his car. Why didn't you just get out of the car? Because I was, I was afraid. Because? They had, there was a cop on my left with a gun pointed at me, and there was one on my right side with a shotgun pointed. And at that moment, I just knew, like, you know, I, had, I even had my phone in my hand, and I dropped my phone and put my hands up. I said, you know, put the guns away. I'm not going to step out the car. Because? You know? I'm afraid that I might get shot. If you got out. Mm -hmm. Jeter faced up to five years in prison. However, his lawyer obtained a second dash cam video that showed a different story. A second police car crossed from the opposite side and rammed into Jeter's car. Dash cam footage from that car showed Jeter with his hands up, clearly not resisting arrest. An officer broke Jeter's window and punched him. They opened the door. One of the officers reached in and just punched me in my face. The officers then dragged Jeter out of his car and started beating him up. Following the discovery of new evidence, 
All charges against Jeter were dropped. Because of them lying that I would have had to do five years in jail. If the tape hadn't surfaced. I was going to be doing jail. I was going to be doing time. In 2016, Corder was convicted and found guilty. As a man of the law, there's an oath that they take, and it's to tell the truth. And in this situation, there was time given for Mr. Corder to tell the truth. He was sentenced to five years in prison with no possibility of parole. While Corder will spend at least five years in prison for police brutality, how does it compare to a cop arguing with the judge in court? Like in the case of former Breckenridge County Sheriff Todd Pate, who was in court today for a plea hearing. Is that your phone, Mr. Pate? Yes, you need to put it away. Okay. I'll just... Have you it. need to put it away. Okay. Yeah. The hearing began with a bumpy start. A year earlier, Pate was arrested for causing a crash while driving under the influence. He was charged with five felonies and a second DUI charge. Pate was to change his plea from not guilty to guilty, a decision he had already agreed to in writing. This deal will allow him to serve only a few days in prison instead of several years. To make it official, all he has to do is utter the words to Judge Janet Crocker. Desire to change your plea uh, from not guilty to guilty. Do I have to answer that yes or no, or can I make somewhat of a statement? That, that, is, that is a yes or no answer, sir. Well, I have the opportunity to say anything further. If you, it is your intention to change your plea from not guilty to guilty, then I will take your plea and certainly you'll have an opportunity to make any statement that you want to make. But if it is not your intent to enter a guilty plea at this time, then I'm going to set your case for jury trial and you're going to stop wasting my time and everybody else's time this afternoon. I'm not trying to waste your time. Then, then is it your intention to enter a guilty plea at this time or not, sir? Judge Crocker ignores Pate checks with the prosecution. Mr. Chambers, what is the Commonwealth's position at this time, sir? Agree to continue this case two months to hear this the judge then calls for a recess, hoping Pate's lawyer could talk some sense into him. Right. Mr. Vows, would you like some additional opportunity to meet with your client this afternoon before we proceed at this time? Um, I don't believe it'd do any harm. I'll thank you very, very quick. I know we've already delayed the court. And I will report back within a couple of minutes. All right, I'll give you I'll give you another ten minutes with him. Back in court, Judge Crocker tries again. Let's get back on the record and see if we can uh, sort this out. What is Mr. Pate's decision with respect to proceeding forward with entry of his guilty pleas? Can I say a few things or? I need to understand what it is that we're doing here today, Mr. Pate. Yes, I've had every intention of coming in here today and entering a guilty plea. You know, it, it's it's difficult for me to enter a guilty plea um, for a lot of reasons, but I don't want this court to think that I am trying to minimize, take away from, or deflect any responsibility that I had in this situation that occurred. The problem was that Pate believed he was forced to take a plea deal. This was never an assault first case. Should have never been an assault first case. But it became that, and it became that to push me in a direction to take a plea. I'm willing to take a plea, but I want this court to know, I want the people to know, I want the public to know that Todd Payne holds himself responsible for everything that he did. But it's hard for me to lay down and plead to felony charges that no reply. Judge Crocker was now starting to lose her patience. Mr. Pate, Nothing. we have reached that point now. Okay. It, this is either a yes or no. Are you going to enter your plea or not? Let me just plead it over with for everybody. Plead to something that I absolutely do not feel good about. Finally, she had enough. Okay, I think we're done. At this point in time, I think we're done. And at this juncture, this court could not, based on these preliminary statements that Mr. Pate has made, make a finding that this plea is knowingly, voluntarily, and intelligently made. Is that on the one hand, the Commonwealth can if chooses to do so, to uh, enforce the terms of this agreement based on the execution. Mr. Pate, I'm talking at this point in time. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. At this point in time, I'm going to sustain the Commonwealth's motion to revoke his bond. He's going to be taken into custody today. 
Your Honor, if I may speak to Mr. Chambers. I've already ruled. I've already ruled at this point in time. We're done at this point in time. We've got a fully executed plea document that provided in pertinent part that he was to serve 75 days in jail, and he's going into jail today under the terms of that plea. Tate eventually pled guilty and accepted the terms of his sentence.